Now, some of you may be a little far off from this just yet, but imagine you've met that special someone, and you get down on one knee, and you're ready to propose, and you bring out your big, shiny, honking diamond, because, hey, they're worth it, and you go to propose to them, and that diamond has turned into graphite. That's right, the stuff that's in the tip of pencils. Well, that's not likely to happen. Although, the conversion of diamond into graphite is energetically favorable at room temperature. But obviously this doesn't happen, or it doesn't happen nearly fast enough. So, why not? Right, well, while this reaction is favorable at room temperature, the conversion of diamond into graphite doesn't really happen until we get to really, really, really high temperatures. Otherwise, we'd all be writing nasty letters to the De Beers people using our ring as a pencil. But this doesn't happen. So why is that the case? Well, even those reactions that we think about occurring rapidly, like lighting a match to put a candle on fire, well, if we think about that, even that lighting a match and even lighting the candle requires some input of energy. And this input of energy can be really small or it can be really large. And we refer to this as the activation energy, the minimum amount of energy required to get a reaction started. And we represent these uh, energies and the overall changes in energies from reactants to products in something called a potential energy diagram which is really just a representation of the chemical potential energy as it moves throughout a reaction. So let's take a look at how we would put together a potential energy diagram. So on the vertical axis, we have potential energy or chemical potential energy. On the horizontal axis, we have reaction progress. And we're going to set this up so right now our reactants are higher energy than our products. And if we think back to enthalpy diagrams, that should tell you something about this particular reaction. So if we take a look here, we have a what appears to be a hump or a hill right in the middle of our reaction progress. This is a little bit different than an enthalpy diagram because it does show the progress of the entire reaction. So the reactance to the top of that hump, which is something we refer to as the transition state, is what we refer to as our activation energy. And this is our activation energy in the forward direction. So this is the activation energy barrier that we have to overcome. That is, when particles collide, they have to have enough energy to overcome that activation energy barrier in order for the reaction to proceed. So when we talk about appropriate amounts of energy for a reaction to occur, this is the amount of energy that's required. As we move through this transition state, which is just the transition between reactants and products, we descend now down into the products, and we notice that if this were re reaction were reversible, that is, if we could go from products to reactants, there would also be an activation energy in the reverse direction. Now, in this particular example, we have the forward activation energy being less than the reverse activation energy. Now, what this means to us is if we take a look at the difference between reactants and products, notice that we have reactants that are greater than the products in terms of the energy. So as this reaction proceeds, the overall net change from reactants to products is going to be negative. That is, we're going to lose energy to our surroundings. And as we know, we refer to this as an exothermic reaction. So this is what a potential energy diagram would look like for an exothermic reaction. Now, what about this transition state, more specifically, this activated complex? Well, let's take a closer look at that. The transition state is a highly unstable state. Now, at this transition state, there's something we refer to as an activated complex. And this activated complex is, again, a highly unstable intermediary or in-between a reactant and a product. So let's take a look at a scenario where we would have uh, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide reacting together. These would be our two reactants. And in a potential energy diagram, we want to be as specific as possible. So we would list these as our two reactants. The activated complex would be somewhere in between the reactants and the products. So we would depict it with bonds forming and bonds breaking. And we typically use dashed lines to indicate that. So the activated complex, since what was going to happen is we're going to have an oxygen being transferred from the nitrogen dioxide to the carbon monoxide, we can see that there's going to be a bond breaking between a nitrogen and an oxygen and a bond forming between the oxygen and the carbon. So that's where these dotted lines come in to denote that. And so our final uh, structures are then nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. 
So we can see this activated complex is a theoretical intermediary that occurs between these two. So when we put together these potential energy diagrams and we're given enough information to figure out what our reactants are and our products are, we are typically asked to come up with theoretical or appropriate activated complex for this particular reaction. Well, what about an endothermic process? Now we have to remember in this instance it's endothermic. Overall energy has to be put into this reaction. That is the reactants are going to have lower energy than our products. So our activation energy barrier in the forward direction is going to be greater than our activation energy barrier in the reverse direction. And we have to remember that our overall enthalpy change, which is just going to be the magnitude of difference between the reactants and the products, is going to be positive. So ultimately our products have to be higher than our reactants. So what we're going to use these for is to evaluate the overall chemical potential energy and we're going to use them to evaluate the activation energy or the minimum amount of energy required to go both in the forward direction and in the reverse in chemical reactions. So ultimately, I want you to be able to depict a reaction based on its energy changes using these potential energy diagrams. Good luck.